Well, welcome everyone to this uh, meeting of the British Sundial Society. Uh, we have been unable to host any kind of regular meeting for over 18 months now, so we thought we would try our hands at Zoom. And we have three uh, noted Sundial speakers on our program uh, today. Uh, Roger Bailey is going to be telling us about Sundials in the Alps. Uh, Woody Sullivan is going to be uh, describing an astonishing reflection sundial, which he keeps at home. And Fred Sawyer is going to be telling us about a suite of horizontal sundials, the like of which you have never seen before. Now, if at any time you would like to you think of asking a question, please use the Zoom chat feature, and I'll try and keep an eye on that as we go along. Uh, what I'm proposing to do is to have a period of questions after each of the main speakers, uh, and um, I will study the, what's come into chat in the meantime. But before I uh, introduce the first of our speakers, um, I note that we have people from over 15 time zones uh, signed up today, and we also have a number of people who are signed on just by way of curiosity in some sense. What is it about Sundials that so appeals to enthusiasts? And to give you just a hint of why enthusiasts like Sundials so much, let me share my screen and show you a photograph. Except that Bill is not letting me share the screen, but we'll share the screen now. Um, here we are. This is a very straightforward um, horizontal sundial. It's almost brand new. Uh, this sundial, this photograph was taken late last year on the day this was installed. Uh, and unfortunately the sun didn't shine, so we can't see the shadow of the gnomon uh, casting itself onto the dial plate, so we can't actually tell the time. But even when the sun isn't shining, there are usually things on sundials to take an interest in. And you'll notice here an inscription, starting with these four letters, uh, which are somebody's initials. And further on, we see a date in Roman numerals, MMXIX is 2019. And 2019 marked the 40th birthday of the owner of the initials. So this is a commemorative sundial. Now, some of you may already have noticed that this Nomon gives the illusion of being transparent. Look, you can seemingly see the hour lines on the far side of the Nomon through the Nomon. You can even see the rim of a supporting stone through the Nomon. But of course, it isn't really transparent. It's actually made of solid brass and is gold plated, which makes it highly reflective. And with this kind of sundial, the hour lines on the far side of the gnomon of a mirror image of the airlines on the near side, hence the illusion. Uh, if you had looked carefully at this ornamental circle, which goes round what I call the root of a gnomon, you'll see a break at this point. And the extent of this break exactly matches the width of the gnomon. This is the giveaway. Now, as it happens, I can show you a photograph of this sundial taken in the sun. Uh, but at a much earlier stage of its construction. And here you see the same sundial outside the Cardozo Kindersley workshop in Cambridge, England. At this stage, the gnomon has been made and has been fitted to the circular slate uh, dial plate. Also, the hour lines have been marked out likely in pencil, but they haven't yet been cut. And I went along to the workshop to check that the hour lines were correctly set out. And I simply measure the angle of each line and make sure that it's the correct angle. I also, uh, somewhat separately, like to check that the edge of a gnomon really does fall, the edge of a shadow of a gnomon really does fall on each hour line in turn. But I don't want to spend the whole day on that, waiting for the sun to go all the way around the sky. So instead, I simply cheat. I leave the sun where I, wherever it happens to be and rotate the sundial on the table. 
And when this photograph was taken, the edge of the shadow uh, was falling along the eight o'clock in the morning hour line, just as I wanted it to. Uh, you can, in this photograph, see another consequence of having a reflective gnomon, which is this patch of brightness on the near side of the gnomon. And this is not a reflection of the gnomon in the dial plate. That's something you do see occasionally after a shower of rain when there is a film of water on the surface. This is quite different. This is a reflection of the sun off the gnomon onto the dial plate. And what we're seeing here is actually a projection of the profile of the gnomon, an oblique projection. Now, at this point, for the benefit of the experts who are with us, I have to make an observation and pose a few questions. Now, the observation is simple enough. Clearly, the sun is shining on the near side of the gnomon. Uh, it is equally clear that the sun is shining on the long, narrow face of the gnomon. Question one, why are we not seeing any sign of a reflection of the long, narrow face, off the long, narrow face onto the gnomon, onto the dial plate? Question two, is there a time of day when we could see reflections off the long, narrow face onto the dial plate? And you can choose your time of year if you wish. Question three, would the answer to either of the first two questions be different if this sundial was designed for and set up for a location north of the Arctic Circle? Oh, and I have one final, more challenging question. At this time, the time this photograph was taken, the reflection of the sun off the gnomon gave rise to this bright patch. Is it possible to get a reflection of the sun off this gnomon so that instead it casts an image of the sun, of the sun onto the dial plate, or if not the dial plate itself, onto some nearby surface? Now, to give further insight into this, I'm going to go back to an even earlier stage of this sundial. This is the original drawing which I prepared and sent to the workshop for working up into a, a more elegant design. Obviously, this was done on a computer. And because it's a computer drawing, I can readily add a synthetic shadow. And I want to show you the shadow at eight o'clock in the morning. Now, this is eight o'clock in the morning in high summer. But even in summer, the sun is not very high above the horizon at eight in the morning. With a low sun, you get a long shadow and it runs off the edge of the dial plate. But the photograph you've just seen was not taken at eight o'clock in the morning. It was a contrived photograph that was actually taken at 11 o'clock in the morning when the sun was much higher. And my computer model then says that the, sun, the shadow will be much shorter looking like this. And that's more or less what you saw in the photograph. Now, I can equally easily add a synthetic bright patch. Here it is. And you can see that the edge of the bright patch is falling along the four o'clock hour line. Now, mention that we have, in some sense, two sundials for the price of one. Let's see how they work. The edge of a shadow is telling us how many hours have elapsed since midnight. Eight o'clock in the morning is, of course, eight hours since midnight. The edge of the bright patch is telling us how many hours there are until midday. Currently four, but as the morning progresses, both these edges advance, and this will count down three hours, two hours, one hour, and then we have midday itself. Something else to notice is that with this, with this design of gnomon, we have two roots of the gnomon. Uh, you can see one a hair on the left and one on the right. And the edge of a shadow runs from the left hand root and the edge of a bright patch runs from the right hand root. And they really are, those two edges really are one the mirror image of the other. But if we look at the two edges that we're not really interested in, let's call them the leading edges, you'll see that they both run to the same point on the right-hand side of the gnomon. 
the bright patch is not quite the mirror image of the shadow. This particular design doesn't have any hour lines before six in the morning or after six in the afternoon. But of course, in British latitudes in summer, the sun can certainly shine at such times. And I want to show you what the shadow would look like at five o'clock in the morning in high summer. It would look like this. Now, the sun is still very low, so we get a very long shadow. But what I want you to notice is that the edge of a shadow now runs to the right hand root of the noon. Moreover, this edge aligns precisely with the five o'clock in the afternoon hour line. But if we now put in the bright patch, we see that the edge of that patch runs to the right hand root of the gnomon as well. So these two edges are no longer mirror images. And this edge is parallel to the seven o'clock in the morning hour line, but not aligned with it. The two leading, leading edges now both go to mirror image points. And I couldn't resist the temptation when I was at the workshop to rotate the dial plate so that the shadow ran, ran along this non-existent five o'clock in the morning hour line. And of course, when I did that, it was still really 11 o'clock. So I got a much shorter shadow, ridiculously short, looking like this. And of course, a correspondingly short uh, stub for the bright patch. Well, this is what the computer predicts the shadow and the bright patch will look like uh, when I've got the shadow running along the non-existent five o'clock in the morning hour line, but the time is really 11 o'clock. Let's have a look and see what it actually looked like. And there you see a short shadow and a short patch. Uh, this is not something you'll ever see once the sundial has been installed, uh, because once it's pointing in the correct direction, uh, shadow can only be along, be along here at se seven o'clock, five o'clock in the morning, and that can happen only uh, when the sun is much lower. That's quite enough for me. So I'm now going to stop sharing, and I want to introduce the first proper speaker, uh, Roger Bailey. Now, Roger Bailey is, I think, the most westerly member of the British Sundial Society. He lives on Vancouver Island, uh, off the west coast of Canada. And he's not only a noted member of the British Sundial Society, he's also a noted member of the North American Sundial Society, where for many years he was secretary. And Roger is going to be telling us about sundials French sundials in the French Alps. Over to you, Roger. Hello. I am. Uh, are people uh, getting me or I don't want to go to share screen yet. Yep, you're, you're good, Roger, carry on. Okay, I will carry on. Uh, I appreciated the invitation uh, to put together a talk for this, this Zoom meeting because I'm like most of you, I've been very frustrated for the last year uh, because I'm now at the stage in my life where I'm still fit, healthy, retired, and I have the money to travel. And if you notice the, my uh, presentations and articles, they have typically been based on sundials in different areas. And to, be, to have to stop doing that is causing me significant frustration. And I don't know in Canada when, uh, flights can go uh, when uh, the borders are open uh, without the restrictions that we have now. So uh, this talk gave me an opportunity to travel in a different way, uh, virtual travel uh, by 
uh, reviewing the sundials that I, I uh, seen in other areas and preparing guidelines, maps for others to travel. And I chose the, the French Alps because uh, France uh, is relatively close to Britain compared to my location here on Vancouver Island. So you will be able to travel when things clear up somewhat there uh, better than I have. So my talk is based on uh, providing you uh, information on uh, interesting sundials in the French Alps. So I'd like to go now to the share screen and start the presentation. And that should be up. I'll just go to full screen. There. Uh, so I'm going to be basing this talk on a particular area in the French Alps, south of uh, the uh, Chamonix Mont Blanc, uh, north of the Riviera, uh, still high mountains. Uh, but people have been occupying this uh, for uh, many centuries, and it's an interesting area. The two uh, people I'm concentrating on are the sundials by Giovanni Francesco Zarbula, who built, designed and built uh, over a hundred sundials in this area between 1832 and 1870. And then I'm going to sit, switch to the sundials of a, a modern uh, designer, uh, Remy Pote, who has been doing this since 82 and has painted uh, somewhere around 200 sundials in the French Alps. So there's uh, lots to, to see there. So there's samples of what these sundial designers, cadrenaires, have, uh, have produced. And that link there will get you immediately to the Google map that uh, shows where their sundials are. So I will now switch to that. And there are the sundials that still exist uh, that were painted by Zarbula between 1832 and 1870. And you can see some concentrations in particular areas. Uh, one is the area near Briançon. The other is this tail going off into Italy and a significant concentration in the, the Cairo, particularly uh, the village of San Varan. And the others are, are spread out uh, as other people uh, saw his sundials and wanted one in their partic particular areas. So this map is pretty limited. It doesn't really tell you much about it, but if you click on uh, any one of the, those, You'll, it'll bring up three things. The first is a picture of the dial in that location. And then there will be a short, uh, short description and a link for further information on waymarking. So let's see what those other ones offer. Uh, there's the waymarking description. You can see there's more information contained there and a better map showing exactly where it is. But the key thing is uh, it gives you access to larger pictures. So if you click on the, the gallery, you can get full-size pictures. So that tells you a lot more about uh, 
this sundial. And the amazing thing is this particular one uh, was painted in 1843. It has not been renewed. The fresco technique using inorganic pigments that are uh, held within the plaster coating on the wall means that these are very long lasting, uh, particularly if they are isolated from the weather. So I wanna to switch to uh, what I think is his signature sundial. Uh, this was created on the home of the uh, Marchesa de Bonadacci, and uh, it contains many of the style features that uh... Okay, here we go. Uh, so this is a typical Zarbula sundial. It starts with a frame, and that frame will uh, have exotic animals on it or flower pots or many different things as distractions. But the key things are the, the dial itself, where this vertical declining dial, the hour lines are laid out uh, correctly. Uh, those are accurate hour lines for that particular location. And the important thing about Zarbula is the method that he developed uh, to be able to do this on site. His method uh, has been uh, decoded uh, and published in 1999 <coughs> by Paul Gagnier. And uh, it's amazing what he could do with a straight edge, a plumb bob, and a compass. The other features are uh, a crescent moon, a religious symbol, a uh, motto, and uh, the date. And the initials of Zarbula, Z, G, F, and the patron who commissioned the sundial, the Marchesa de Bonadeci. So moving forward, Another one, this is in the south of the area uh, at the end of a remote road. And you can see this was built 1860 and uh, some different features are included. Uh, there is, instead of a rooster or an exotic bird, this is the imperial eagle. And the, this also includes these Masonic symbols, the compass and, uh, and square. And those were the kind of tools that Zarbula used to, to design the sundials. And he has included the Masonic symbols on seven ex existing sundials, uh, three in France, four in Italy. So it was a time of change when he did those, 1860 to 1870, at the time of the Franco-Prussian War, the uh, Third Empire, etc. So you can learn a lot of history by inspecting in detail things like this. Want to move forward to Saint Varan, where he has uh, painted seven sundials out of the 36 that uh, exist in this village. Again, this goes back to the original things, the exotic birds, the dates, the religious symbols, uh, the frame, uh, colors, etc. And again, that is an original dial that has been there since then. Also in San Varan is, is this particular dial. And you can see here the paint is quite fresh. 
because that has been restored uh, in 1995 by the next person I want to talk about, Remy Pote. And there's Remy hard at work uh, restoring this sundial. He uh, grew up in the area. He was a uh, studied nature. He uh, taught himself the fresco techniques and has become a, a prize winning illustrator artist. Various uh, prizes have recognized his, his talents and his style is following Zabula's uh, folk art. But the difference is he is a significantly better artist, particularly showing animals and things like that. And there's his map, and you can see the concentrated area uh, up in the upper right around San Varan and the Kera, and another area down here. Uh, this is when he was a, a young man starting out living uh, at home, uh, and later he moved to San Varan. And this is from the uh, Lorange Monteglin area. This sundial shows the crests of the various villages. Each of these villages have sundials uh, by Pote. And the declination of the wall is fairly extreme. And so he was creative when it came to the, the timelines indicated. Uh, from this point of view, they're going from one hour to eternity. And again, in that area, this shows the landscape. This is on a, uh, a town hall, uh, a meeting room for old friends. And that shows the details. So this area is actually in the uh, foothills to the west of the Alps. This particular one shows his uh, artistic ability when it came to uh, painting of the uh, fauna that existed uh, in this area. So mountain goats, a gopher, and over here, an exotic bird, uh, uh, pupae, bighorn sheep, etc. So his focus was on the picture rather than on the sundial lines, but he did uh, learn how to design a sundial with accurate lines. And he had fun with some of them, like this one, the nude and the fountain. That's in downtown Embrun. And you can see this dial has uh, the declination lines for the uh, solstices and the equatorial line. And again, he had fun with the mottos on some of these. At all hours, St. Peter, open the door for us. This is probably his most complicated one from a sundial point of view, because it's actually uh, two sundials. So you see the, the round one here is a standard uh, one showing uh, solar time with 12 noon being vertical. And beneath that are a more, is a more complicated dial with a series of declination lines and the, and the uh, analemma shape showing the equation of time. And you can see in the area to the lower right, the backwards R and P you'll find those and that, that trademark of his on almost all of his dials. 
And another one he had fun with, uh, the Vitruvian man uh, who's using his maleness to, uh, as, a, as a nomen. So again, in the Kera area, he has been quite active. Uh, this is in San Varan, uh, San Tropez, showing the, uh, the legend of the headless body after he was executed. The dog and rooster that was supposed to eat him as he was set adrift from Rome but landed in Saint-Tropez uh, on the French coast, so they say. And again, in saint Varan, this one of the raptor, that's the picture we started with. And another one in saint Varan, uh, the Luna sundial, the woman on the crescent moon, and again, a picture of Remy hard at work. Four birds. And you can see his trademark is hidden over in the corner here. And just throwing in a few pictures to show his, how his pictures dominated his sundials. This one I found interesting. That's the picture uh, that I took, uh, but I didn't get the location. I didn't get a GPS reading. Uh, but this picture is from uh, Google Street View. As the Google vehicle drove past, it took this picture and you can see it's sort of hidden in the under here, but it gives you the accurate latitude and longitude of where the, the camera was. So that was a useful feature. So that's my talk uh, about these two cadronaires, and I would welcome you to, uh, to follow up on the maps and the information provided and uh, get back to me if you have any questions. So I'm going to stop the sharing and continue to talk. Are there, Frank, are you asking for questions at this time? Yes, there, there have been a number of questions. This is, this is an excellent meeting because what happens is that somebody asks a question and then Martin's Gills gives the answer, which saves a lot of time. Um, so thank you, Martin's. Are you there with us? Perhaps you can unmute yourself and talk to us. Uh, but the one uh, question which was of more general interest, uh, which hasn't been answered, is whether there are any webcams. Now, who's asked this? Kurt Neal has asked that question. Are there any webcams looking at these um, sundials? Well, I can give him several answers to that. Not as far as I know in Roger's talk, but I certainly had a webcam courtesy of Olivetti Limited, if you ever remember that company, pointing at one of my sundials in Cambridge. And much more recently, uh, Woody Sullivan, who is our next speaker, also has a webcam or had a webcam pointing at one of his uh, sundials in Seattle. Uh, Woody, can you nod your head? You don't need to say anything more just yet. <laughs> yep, yep, there he is. That's, he may be able to say something about that later. Let's not discuss that too much now. Um, you can see the chat just as well as I can. Uh, somebody asked about the... Uh, diagonal lines which are shown on some of these sundials again martin's answered that question and um explained that this is the equinoctial line uh, and there seems to be a general chat about that and uh, we either everybody understands that or they don't but it is very common to find diagonal lines on sundials uh so Roger, you can see the chat list too. Can yes, you see anything? I'm, I'm going to answer the one below that, a tutorial on one of these fantastic uh, sundials. Oh, yes. Uh, the best thing for that would be the uh, paper that was published in the Mass Compendium 
on uh, Zarbula, as in particular Zarbula's methods, where I go through each of the steps required to apply his method on the wall that you, you are interested in. That's in the compendium 14-4, December 2007. So it's, it's quite a while ago. And if uh, you uh, write to me uh, at uh, rtbailey101 at gmail, uh, I would be happy to send you a, a copy of that particular paper. Thank you. And uh, one question, which um, again Martin has answered, Martin's has answered, is about the the links which you put up near the beginning of your talk. Uh, they were sent out with the invitation. So anybody still interested to know which the, the links to the two sets of sundials that Roger has been talking about, um, go back to your invitation, which you received a repeat of this morning. And uh, when I say this morning, I mean earlier. A few hours ago and that that's that will have the two links on it and they've also been put up in the chat list i think um we'll deem that to be sufficient questions just for the moment uh, and it's now time for me to introduce our second speaker uh woody sullivan uh, and he i think is our third most westerly member uh, there is steve lelieve who i think is between uh, longitude is between Rogers and, and Ro Rogers and Woody's. Uh, Woody's going to be telling us about his extraordinary reflection sundial, which is actually behind him. He'll, I'll leave it to him to show it to you. But uh, I have been in the very office that um, Woody is sitting in, uh, and I don't ever remember seeing any books. I spent my entire time in this wonderful room looking at the ceiling. So. Woody is, of course, another noted member of the British of the North American Sundial Society. He lives in Seattle. He's made um, or designed lots of sundials which are in and around Seattle. Uh, he does have some sundials further afield. In particular, he is noted for having two sundials on Mars. And at the moment, you don't get further away than that for your sundials. I'll hand over to you, uh, Woody, and um, up to you to go on. Okay. So I'll assume that that is going out to people Okay, and also the audio. Um, it's lovely to see all those faces there. Many of them I haven't seen for a long time. Um, and uh, for instance, Helmut in Austria. And there's this guy called Len Imac, uh, who I think I know who he is. He doesn't live very far from Seattle, but that's a strange last name, Imac, uh, that he has. But I'm delighted to uh, be able to give, give this talk um, I had hoped to uh, carry my laptop around and show you some of the ceiling, but my laptop left this moral coil um, and I just don't have a laptop right now. And so I'm just gonna have to lift up my big And I cannot see what you're seeing, but I trust you. Oh, yes, I can. I trust you're seeing the ceiling there in what I call the man lodge. It's a, it's a separate a converted garage next to my house. And you'll see that it's got uh, a blue and orange pattern all over it. And you'll be seeing lots of slides of what it is. So then I'll put this uh, 15 pounds seven kilos back down before it breaks and we'll get going here. Okay. Um, my next slide is not working here. I'm not, the arrow 
is not working for for next slide. Why is that? We did have a little rehearsal. Um, I'll try these arrows over here. That works. Inspiration for the style. Uh, there are three in particular in, in Europe that have inspired me. I'll show you two of them. One is in the Palazzo Spada, uh, right in the center of Rome uh, from the 17th century. And um, these types of dials have a little mirror. In this case, the mirror is here. I trust you can see my um, cursor okay. And it casts a spot of light up onto the ceiling. And so this is what we mean by a reflection ceiling uh, sundial. And um, this made quite a sensation uh, when this Jesuit built this in the 17th century. And it still can be seen quite nicely today, as you see in the middle picture. And then another one in Grenoble, the Elise Stendhal, uh, made by another Jesuit about the same time, uh, has a small mirror here on a stairway that, that curls around near this window. And so uh, the spot of light gets cast into a, um, a landing and it gets cast onto two sides of this stairway uh, before and after the landing. It's quite complex as you can see uh, and still working quite nicely if you ever get to uh, visit that um, school in Grenoble. So I, I, I wanted to build one of these and um, when I was converting the garage, I said, well, this is when I can do it. I can, I can put a window where I want to and I can make the ceiling so that it'll work, et cetera, et cetera. What were my design goals? I wanted to make it beautiful and complex. I wanted to make it a dialist dial, not for the public. So I could put in things like astrology, which I don't like to, as an astronomer, I don't like to uh, put this out in a public dial. Uh, I could also have much more complexity. I wanted to make a true tradition, but also part of our present century. I wanted to personalize it in many ways, which you'll see, and also put in some unique features and some fun features a la uh, Remy Poti. The setting. So here is on the bottom here, here's the man lodge. Um, and on a south, this exactly south facing window is a little pipe with a <coughs> two and a half centimeter mirror on it. And why isn't it down on the windowsill? Because I wanted to get that mirror exactly where I wanted it in order for over the entire um, range of declination of the sun over the year that um, it would cover the ceiling, but not be too much. Um, and so that was, I was quite worried about as to whether the in the winter time, the spot of light would start going down on the bookcases on the north side, but fortunately it doesn't. Uh, so that's what's casting the spot of light. And here you see, I've got about a 75 degree view looking from the window uh, cut off by trees and neighbor's houses and my own house uh, here on the right. The team, I was very lucky to find just the right artist. Uh, normally he does, uh, commercial painting, you know, to put on a, uh, a guy that's selling cars, you know, to have a big painting of a turkey or something at Thanksgiving, whatever. Um, but he loved this project. He gave me a very good price. And for about four weeks, uh, we worked together, making hundreds of decisions on, on colors and widths of lines and symbolism and on and on. It was, it was just a great time. Uh, this is all in 2011 uh, that it was done. And here you see I, comp I computed it and Jim painted it. The construction, very briefly. Uh, one difficulty is that the ceiling is complex. Uh, I, because it was a garage, it had sloping uh, ceilings. So the center is horizontal, more or less. These slope by about 20 degrees each way. And for this and other reasons, I decided I wasn't going to calculate this whole thing and just paint it and then see what happened. Uh, I was going to have a semi-empirical approach. And what was that approach? It was over the three years before we did this project, I <clears throat> marked about 700 sunspots, spots of sunlight of a few centimeters in size cast onto the ceiling whenever the sun was out and I was around, 
but always on an even half hour in local solar time so that I had those hour lines securely marked on the ceiling. Everything else used those as fiducials so that I was then calculating where the azimuth line should go, uh, where, where um, uh, the, the declination of the sun should go, things like this. Um, and so they are somewhat less accurate depending on uh, their relationship to these half hour lines. The typical accuracy is about two or three minutes uh, if you average over the entire um, uh, ceiling. So here we are at work. There's Jim painting and uh, here's me uh, measuring away and calculating. Uh, and this is what we ended up with about a three by five meter pattern. Um, and this is now with the winter solstice on the bottom. That's the furthest from the window when the sun is coming in low and the summer solstice at the top in the red for hot and the blue for cold winter. Uh, the opposite, by the way, of the colors of stars. It's very confusing for an astronomer. Um, and here is what it looks like. Um, I wanted to have, for instance, this uh, way of showing the half hour lines, um, not by making lines, but just by having alternating colors. I'd seen that and I liked that. But it was Jim's skill. And you see how he's feathered the, the colors, uh, which makes it so much more dynamic and, and interesting rather than just putting up the solid, two solid colors. Just as one example amongst many of his great contribution. So most of this talk is about furniture. Um, and furniture, uh, for those of you who don't know, means stuff that you don't really need on a dial to tell the time, but it's a hell of a lot of fun uh, if you're into this, which if you're spending your Saturday listening to this talk, then you must be into it to some extent. So first signs of the Zodiac. Um, we started from a 16th century set um, that uh, Jim kind of liked. Uh, and we about half of them are from the 16th century. The other half are ones that I've adapted to the Northwest of the US where I live um, or to astronomy in some way or to history of astronomy as you'll see. For instance, in Taurus, the famous Crab Nebula is in Taurus just off one of the, one of the um, horns of the bull. And um, that's a supernova that went off in the 11th century that the Chinese observed, uh, very important in astronomy. Uh, for cancer, we have a local crab, the Dungeness crab, delicious as Roger can attest. Um, for Pisces, we've got a local salmon uh, here, um, <clears throat> sockeye. They're delicious, they get very red before they finally spawn and die. Uh, Gemini, I couldn't think of any Northwest thing. Scorpio, we have a scorpion from the desert part of the Northwest here. Um, <clears throat> we do have mountain uh, lions, as sometimes called that. They're, we call them cougars, um, but uh, I, did, I decided not to put that in. So those are six of them. Here's the other six. Sagittarius is the direction towards the center of our galaxy. There's a black hole there called Sagittarius A star, which is the very center of our galaxy, about a million times the mass of the sun. So that's what that black dot is there. Um, we have mountain goats here, that's Capricorn. Libra, the scales, we'll come to that in the next slide. And Virgo, I wanted to make her a nice, sexy 21st century lady. None of this um, uh, <clears throat> Renaissance kind of stuff. And so that's where she is. But what is on her back? Those are uh, <clears throat> tattoos, uh, supposedly. And the tattoos are of what? They are galaxies because the Virgo cluster of galaxies is the nearest large cluster to us and extremely important in astronomy for determining the overall distance scale of the universe. Um, and so that's why that makes sense other than being very pleasing to look at. Um, now what's going on with Libra there? Well, this comes from the frontispiece of a book by <coughs> Giovanni Riccioli who was a rival to Galileo. And even though this is a century after Copernicus, uh, the Copernicus system was not accepted by everyone by any means. And um, so this book was by Riccioli was arguing that the, the system that Tycho had put together long before 
was superior to the Copernican system. And so to show this in the frontispiece, he has the two systems, whoops, here they are. And the more weighty one is that of Tycho. Copernicus is a lightweight system. But I'm a Copernican uh, as a practicing astronomer. And so in my Libra, the Copernican system outweighs the Tychonic system. And uh, I didn't get kicked out of the American Astronomical Society. Um, but what about the zodiacal, zodiacal or zodiacal, however you want to say it, signs? Where should they be placed um, in terms of on the, on the ceiling? Well, here you get into the phenomenon of pre uh, precession, which I don't have time to explain. Uh, learn something about it on Wikipedia or whatever. Um, but the Earth's axis does this 26,000 mile thing, as you see in the diagram in the upper right here. And that means that the whole coordinate system is going around every 26,000 years because it's based on the Earth's axis. And so that means the equator is going around. And since the equator goes around, that means that the vernal equinox is going around, which is the intersection of the equator and the ecliptic. And so when astrology was set up, <clears throat> they looked at the, where the sun was at that time, at a given time of the year. But now we've gone uh, about one thirteenth of the way around, or no, one, one uh, sixth of the way around, 4,000 years later. And so the sun is not behind the constellation that you think. When you're a Taurus, the sun is not in the constellation of Taurus. It's shifted by 60 degrees on the sky. So as an astronomer, I didn't want to do that. So my Taurus bill is not, bull is not in April, May, as like you see in a standard horoscope, but rather it's in June and July. And so the sun is actually in front of those stars in Taurus in June and July. Uh, I love the mottos that sundials have, uh, as I'm sure many of you do. Uh, the motto here, uh, in deference to the French uh, <coughs> of, sun, of, of reflection dials, vous et moi ne sommes rien sans la réflexion, which I thought was very apt you and I are nothing without reflection, especially uh, given that it's reflection dial and that I try to do a little bit of mental reflection uh, in this room. Um, but this has another little thing built into it. And that is a chronogram. Uh, this goes back to uh, classical Latin times. And then in the Renaissance, uh, the idea was that you would hide dates in your text uh, with using Roman numerals. And so uh, usually the Roman numerals are not in order, but here I was able to get them in order and get a motto that really makes sense. And I can't hear the applause, but I really like that. Uh, so here you see MM, that's why they're large, XI, 2011, that's when the dial was done. Usually these um, Roman numerals are much longer, of course, especially if they're a year, and they're not in order. So you still have ambiguity as to when the book was written. Oh, let's get on to flies. Many of you are familiar with um, stained glass sundials that have a gnomon on the outside of the window casting a shadow and you read it from the inside. But there was a tradition that developed in the 17th century was sort of the peak of it, of painting a realistic fly on these things. No one quite knows how, I mean, why, but Maybe a pun on time flies. Um, here you have an actual motto in this center one here, uh, meaning while you watch, I fly. And in this one, they, for realism, he put the wings on the opposite side of the window from the body the painter did. Uh, just incredible. And so I wanted to do this, uh, but I don't have a stained glass window here. Um, so I said, what the hell, let's uh, do something different and I super glued a fly to the ceiling. And then I said, well, why stop there? Uh, let's put some other insects up on the ceiling. And so here you see a moth and a beetle and there are now are about 10 different uh, insects up on the ceiling. After 10 years now, almost to the month, only the fly has fallen down and I had to put another fly up. All the others have stayed up. And then because we're in this wet part of the climate, we have lots of slugs around. 
But I figured that super gluing a slug on the ceiling might get a little messy after a few months. And so this is actually made out of rubber. Uh, but it has not fallen down. It's, it's glued up very nicely. My son-in-law, uh, Jeremy, who's also on the ceiling on his, for his birthday, makes flies for fishing. And this is actually a fly that he has handmade. Um, these sunspots, as I call them, nothing to do with the black sunspots on the sun, of course, are the actual shapes of the spot of light that you get off the circular mirror as it gets uh, projected onto the ceiling. And over the three years, as I did uh, these marks, I would so often um, trace the shape of it. Not Usually it was just the X in the center. Uh, but here was on Obama's election in 2008. I wanted to commemorate that. And here it was on Herschel's discovery of Uranus, happened on March 13th, 1781. Here it was exactly the vernal equinox to within minutes and this is the vernal equinox line here. And so you only see about half of this longish ellipse. Here was my 64th birthday uh, then. And so this lends some personality to it. And if it should be raining, which it now does once in a while here in Seattle, uh, I think it does a little bit in Britain now and then too, uh, people could still see what the spots looked like in the different parts of the... Um, um, and I see that I'm just out of time, I'm gonna go very quick. Uh, because part of the pattern is on, uh, on the Eastern wall, you get these crazy lines like this. This is, this is a continuous date line here. The spot will go along. But at one point, when it's half on the ceiling, half on the wall, you get this shape for your sun spot. Well, that sure looks like a heart. And what time of the year do you think it falls? Valentine's, completely serendipitously, for about a week before and after Valentine's Day, you get a heart there, although the sun isn't out very much in February in our part of the world. Uh, it has an analemma, which are made out of beads that have polished gray hematite. <coughs> hematite, I'm sorry. Uh, this mineral is also found on Mars, where to this day, as Frank mentioned, lie two Mars dials on the rover Spirit and Opportunity, which have now both died after many, many years of service. May they rest in peace. This is extremely important for my business because this can only be made in the presence of warm water. And that shows us that Mars had warm water in the past. It does not uh, now. Commemorated dates, you often see that on dials. I have it here for family and for um, some other odd things that have to do with uh, uh, Don Larson's perfect game in the 1956 World Series, for those of you that know anything about such things. And, uh, and now I've run out of time here. Um, there are dials telling me how many hours it is till dawn. Uh, not dials, lines, because I'm a night owl. And that's what I need to know. Um, there's the declination of the sun, azimuth. There's sidereal dials telling me when two radio sources, I'm a radio astronomer, um, when they are transiting. So we have essentially a sidereal lines here. And this is hours of daylight. I'll close with this. Um, every sundial that shows you hours of daylight will show it on the equinox that there's 12 hours of daylight. But no, there aren't. If you define it in the usual way from when sunset is to sunrise, the other way around, uh, on, the, on the equinox here in Seattle, you have 12 hours to find that way three days earlier. And on the equinox, you have, actually have nine and a half minutes. And so my 12 hours here does not coincide with the uh, equinox line. Here's the 13 hour line here uh, about um, um, a month later and so forth. And so we'll skip that one and Here's furniture, furniture. The spots fall on the sides of some bookcases. And so we painted some lines on there too. And here I wanted to say we had the dedication of the dial in 2011, NAS met here in Seattle. And who's this guy on the floor trying to get a picture of it all without a wide enough angle lens? Oh, that's who it is. It's our chairman uh, of this session and of the British Sundial Society. And that's it. Thank you.
Can you stop sharing? I will. I've Thank stopped. you very much. And um, I've even got the hat so that people can see that I'm properly dressed for <laughs> <laughs> dealing with your, your um, and, questions. And Fra Frank, are you wearing the same tie? I am, of course, wearing the same tie. Yeah, here, here you are. You can see it. I, 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 won't, I won't ask about the other clothing, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I, as with all Zoom meetings, one dress is only down to the waist. <laughs> Now, uh, there are lots and lots of things came in from this. Uh, yeah, fantastic. Best thing ever. Wow. Fantastic. But, well, you've just got lots of accolades there, Woody. Um, you can read the chat just as well as I can. Um, I'm not quite sure I see anything which counts as a question. Oh, yes. Um, yep, 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 yep. Uh, Yes, lots of people are saying you're going to have to upgrade this uh, when there are in forty twenty in particular. Uh, <laughs> when the... <laughs> yes, yes, I don't think we need to go too much into that. Um... Yeah. Yes, well, is is refraction through the some the window glass an issue? Uh, it is, uh, and so uh, it's it's a it's a window that has uh, two parts. I forget the proper name for that kind of window. Um, and so you, if the spot of light is going through the upper half of the window, then you have to take that part down. If it's going th through the bottom half, you have to put it up, uh, or else the the um, um, it's a double it's a it's a double window also, you know, for uh, conserving heat. Um, and uh, you might th you might have thought that that would uh, correct it um, uh, somewhat, but it doesn't. Um, so anyway, uh, I, it, it, it is done for um, coming through the air, not through the glass. And, and Fred has um, put, in a quest, put in a point about Copernicus. Maybe Fred can address this one himself. Fred, did it, Fred says that um, Copernicus did an earlier reflection, reflection sundial. Uh, does it still exist? Back. I, I, I'm I'm not familiar with the reflections. Oh, oh, yeah. do, you mean as a, do you mean in, in Wolfsorp or do you mean later on? Um, I'm not. I, I'd have to look up now where it uh, uh, where it is. But it is a. It's just a strip on the, the ceiling, and um, there have been some articles done on it. Oh, this is the one that was that was kind of hidden behind something. I think. Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, I, I really don't know that much about it. And, and then he had two uh, wall dials inside his uh, house also. Yeah. Now, several people want to make something similar. Um, a message which I've now lost from Joanna Migdal, who would like to do this in her studio. How do you set about it? Have you got a handbook on how to do it? <laughs> uh, no. Um, the, the, the best thing to, the best thing to do as I did it in my kitchen first is is simply to play around with it where are you going to put the mirror and see what happens over a few months and you get a feeling for the size of the pattern that you're going to get um, and uh, and how close you're going to have to have the mirror to the ceiling that will make a smaller pattern uh, the further away you have it from the ceiling will make a larger pattern uh, it doesn't have to be a south facing window, of course, it can be just as long as it gets the sun, at least part of the year. Uh, and you can just do a noon mark also, uh, just do an analemma. That's what I did in the kitchen ceiling uh, many years before this. Uh, just uh, do it at clock noon. Uh, you got to worry about your gutters, you know, how, how far out they go for the high sun in the summer. There, there's lots of practical problems, but um, it's fun. Now, Sarah Schechner says, um, did Fred really mean Newton rather than Copernicus? I'm not no. in a well good. <laughs> no, I, I, I did mean Copernicus. Um, I'm not familiar with Newton's actual reflection dial, whether it exists or not, if it ever existed. But uh, the one I'm talking about is by Copernicus. Ah, OK. Um, that, that I have heard about, yes. 
there are several more questions. I think um, we'll pen those. Uh, I would like now to take my hat off to um, Woody and move on to Fred. Fred is uh, not merely a noted member of the North American Sundial Society, he's actually president and gives really splendid talks, which I have me hanging, hanging off the edge of my seat. And this one you're about to hear is no exception. And uh, so if you're ready, Fred, I will hand over to you. Yes, thank you, Frank. Let's see if I can bring this up. And for some reason, it does not want to. There we go. Good day to you all. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about uh, what I call hybrid Procellier sundials and uh, show you some designs I think you'll probably agree you've never seen before. All of these designs will be uh, azimuthal sundials. Uh, you're probably familiar with uh, some azimuthals. Um, these are two rather uh, uh, traditional ones. They're horizontal sundials using a straight vertical gnomon, in this case placed here in the center. And you have two sets of uh, curves, one set for the date. Uh, you can set that pretty much any way you want. Here it's done as concentric circles. And then the other set you have to calculate to give you timelines. And the this is the, the basic <laughs> formula, which is used throughout uh, for all azimuthal dials. Here's a, another configuration here. I used uh, concentric squares just to get some straight lines for the declination. But you see, once you've done that, you're at, you have to give in to whatever the math says the other set of lines have to be. And here we get some strange curves. So this works, but it's a... Uh, uh, it's, it's not uh, that easy to do. So when you're doing azimuthal sundials, you have a great deal of freedom. You can choose your date lines almost any way you want, but once you do that, you turn yourself over to the math, let the equations tell you where the hour lines have to be. And the question I asked myself was, can we get both sets, the date lines and the hour lines, to be straight? Just two sets of straight lines. The answer is yes, we, we can come close to doing that. In order to show you how we're going to do that, we have to introduce some equations. Not everyone likes equations, but uh, there, there, were, there are a lot of equations behind what I'll show you. And in this slide presentation, you won't see most of them. They're on hidden slides. If you'd like to get a copy of the slide presentation, you can send me an email uh, that I just sent the, on the chat, uh, the address to use, and I'll send you a copy and then you can click at the bottom where there's a square saying equations, you click on that and you'll get the whole thing laid out. But for this, we just need a few equations. Here we have a coordinate system. We're gonna have our gnomon uh, right here at the origin. Our latitude is, uh, is phi. We're gonna need a constant. I'm just gonna pick one negative 0.8749. Hold on to that. Uh, this constant, as it turns out, has a, a, a significant effect on the, on the use of the sundial, and we'll, we'll see that later. But for now, we start with this equation for delta being the solar declination. If we set that constant, it, uh, pick any day, set it constant. This is the equation of a straight line, or actually two straight lines, because we have a plus or minus here. We'll have this is, will be the declination line, the date line for the morning and here for the afternoon. Now we have one other equation. It's this equation. This is dependent upon T, which is the hour angle. If we yes. set T well, constant, if we, hold, if, if we hold T constant, uh, we'll get a straight line. Um, here, for example, this is a 2 p.m straight line. The combination of date and time will give you, you'll have an intersection. 
And if this is going to work as a sundial, what we want is for the shadow of the vertical gnomon to fall on this line passing right through the intersection. In order for that to happen, this angle has to equal the azimuth of the sun. Now, can we be certain that's going to happen? Well, you have to do a little bit of math. You put these two equations together and you come up with this equation, which is the equation of this line. Again, it's a straight line, that's the equation. And uh, if you expand this and do a little bit of the algebra, it comes out to the equation I, I pointed out before, the, which underlies all azimuthal sundials. So we do have a legitimate azimuthal sundial. And the, what the design comes out to be is something like this. We have two lattices, one for the morning, one for the afternoon. You see the vertical lines are the declination lines. Uh, we'll have blue for the cold winter, green for the equinoxes, and uh, red for the hot summer. And there are lines in between. We have, I've shown one line for each month in between. How does this work? Suppose we look at it, uh, say, at the equinox. Uh, the gnomon is here at the sunrise, 6 a.m. It casts this shadow. And the intersection of the shadow with the equinox line occurs at 6 a.m. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So it goes through the morning. We can have quarter hours, half hours. We can mark whatever we want in the morning. But now at 11, we have to, have to take a, a deep breath and we're going to leap across this gap. It's a gap where there are no hour markings at all. We go from 11 to 12, nothing in between. And then you take another deep breath because you've got another gap to worry about and go from 12 to 1. Having hit one, now we just let it run and we have two, three, four, five, and six. And you can have any time markings uh, in between that you like. This is basically uh, what I call a Pocellier sundial. I wrote about these uh, back in 2006. There's the reference. It's a, <clears throat> in 2006, I gave the very general theory of these. You can, they work with a plane at any orientation you like. And the declination lines, date lines are all straight. The hour lines are all straight. You have a straight gnomon of indeterminate length and pointing at any angle. You can have the gnomon vertical, horizontal, you can have it off at angles, whatever way you like. And the theory gives you uh, uh, the lines that you need for a Pocellier sundial. So that's what this is. One of the big drawbacks is you got to mind the gap, as all our UK friends will be familiar with uh, that expression. Um, what I was hoping to do was find a way to fill in that gap. How can we put some uh, time markings in between 11 and 1? Well, we're going to do that by hybridizing the Pocellier sundial. We're going to come up with uh, different ways to do it, uh, uh, three different ways. One is using circles, parabolas, and the, the third is uh, using straight lines. So how do we do that? First thing we notice is there's nothing magical about 11 o'clock and, and 1 o'clock. I just cut things off at that point. These lines, the declination lines, actually continue all the way up, all the way. It's like a big steel superstructure going all the way up. But the hour from 11 to 12 would go all the way up to infinity. The hour from noon to one over here would also take up an infinite distance. My screen isn't that large. We, we can't do that. So I said, all right, let's, let's cut things off at 11 o'clock and one o'clock. But we need to recognize that the lines actually would continue mathematically if we wanted them to. So suppose we have, uh, say, 1245 up here on the winter solstice. If we mark that, this line would be the correct line 
uh, up to A. Um, we want to find a way to take that steel superstructure I mentioned and you know bend steel with our bare hands and make it curve down and compress it so that all of the line, all of the points and lines that are up here will be curved down and show up in this gap. To do that, uh, we note A, the line, we, we would just pick any line up here we were looking at. It's at a distance from the origin equal to D. And let's pick a radius, R, and draw this circle. And what we want to do is reflect all of the lines that are outside of the circle back into the circle. We can do that by multiplying the coordinates of A by R over D squared. If we do that, A yields this point B. B is uniquely attached to A and vice versa. And B lies within this circle. So matter, no matter how far out, no matter how close to infinity we get out for A, its reflection will be B within this circle. And also, most importantly, B lies on the line that we need, the azimuth line. So the sundial will continue to work. If we take all of the points outside, all of the A points, and replace them with the B points, we'll get a sundial that works. And all of those points from 11 to 1 o'clock will be within this gap. Well, how does that look? Those, that, those straight lines now are suddenly going to be contracted and curved. They actually become circular arcs. And that's what it looks like. How does this work? Well. We know we can use the dial up until 11 o'clock. And at that point, at 11, the, the dial passes the baton onto this, this uh, new design in the center. And here we have 11 o'clock, 11.15, 30, 11.45, 12, 12.15, 30, 12.45, one o'clock, and then the baton goes back up here, and we follow the lattice down. So we have a sundial that works for the entire day. I think that's a, a very nice looking design. I think of it as a, a blooming flower in the mathematical garden between the lattices. However, some people have told me it actually looks like a noxious weed taking root in an unwanted crack between the lattices. So. For those people, let's find an alternative. What we'll do is um, uh, force the declination lines to be straight. And then we have to turn things over to the math and see what uh, the hour lines look like. So if here we've, we're back to a standard Procellier line. The declination lines say we've got this for the what summer solstice say. Declination line goes up to 11. We want to get over to here to one so we can go back down. Well, the easiest thing to do is just draw a straight line. Lay a wooden plank along our superstructure here. And there we've got wooden planks for the summer equinox and for the, uh, the winter solstice. So that was very easy, straight lines. But now we have to uh, let the math show us what kind of a curve we're going to get for the hour lines. I'll draw them in. There they are. That looks pretty straight to me, but it's not. It's actually a parabola. You wonder how? Well, there you see for 1230, for example, that is the entire curve. If we draw it in for all of the lines, we get a whole bunch of parabolas. So these hour lines are actually portions of a parabola. But they're so far away from the vertex of the parabola that they look almost straight. In fact, if you want, you could replace these curves by straight lines. 
just use the math to figure out uh, where the line should be uh, for the winter solstice up here and where it should be for the summer solstice down here and draw a straight line connecting them. So then you have straight lines. They're not exact, they're approximate, but they're straight lines. Let's, I'm, I'm gonna replace these lines that are brown or red or however they appear on your screen. I'm gonna re replace them with straight blue lines. So watch very closely and you see there's very little change. There, those are the blue lines. Those are approximations. I'll go back and do that one more time. You look at the blue lines, we'll put in the, the correct curved lines. And now we'll go back to the straight line approximations. So as you can see, you can use the straight lines and get a, what is a fairly close approximation. I went through and did the calculations and I found that in my latitude, the maximum error, you, if I use a straight line, is never more than 16 seconds. In the UK, you're uh, you know above 50 degrees latitude, you're gonna have latitude less than eight seconds at any time during the year. So you can probably with a good conscience draw straight lines in, instead of uh, parabolas. However, if eight seconds bothers you, you can actually cut that uh, pretty much in half if you use two straight lines instead of one. Suppose we, we draw a straight line, not from solstice to solstice, but draw a straight line from winter solstice to equinox, and then another straight line from equinox to summer solstice. So if we do that, we can end up with, say, six months here, equinox to summer solstice and back. We just use this portion of the dial. And then when you want to come, when you, you're no longer in spring and summer, just flip the dial 180 degrees and you now go from equinox up to winter solstice and back down to equinox. So that is another, another design. You have six months on top, six months on the bottom. Now, when we lay things out this way, uh, it, it helps to make clear some of the, the issues that you might have with uh, this design. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, people have mentioned to me they don't like this, this uh, angled line. They'd, they'd really prefer to have the corners be straight up here. So or squared, square off the corners. Don't use an angle. So there's no intersection there. Well, it turns out you can do that by changing the value of K. Uh, so I'm going to uh, increase its absolute value, uh, go from negative 0.875 to negative 1.53. When I do that, here's what happens. Now we have squared corners, no overlapping, and it's a different design. But this one really points out a problem. Notice here we have our summer solstice lines way out here. They're, they're pretty far. They're the farthest away from the gnomon base. And what do we know about solstice, summer solstice shadows? They're the shortest of the year. So it, it would be nice if we had this summer solstice line, instead of being way out here, if we could have it within this rectangle, you know, a rectangle that's it's defined by the equinox lines. Is there a way to move them inside as we have with the, uh, the uh, winter solstice? Well, again, it goes back to our value for K. As it turns out, the key thing here is that when the solar declination is positive and K is negative, we end up with things outside the rectangle. If K is negative and the solar declination is also negative, things end up inside. So when these signs are the same is when you get things inside the, the equinox rectangle. So what we'll do here is leave this K for the winter portion of the year 
and we'll make this a positive 1.53. And if we do that, this is what we get. So now everything fits nicely within the rectangle. Summer solstice lines uh, dates is much closer to the gnomon base. But notice I said, I called this a rectangle. And if you look, it sure doesn't look like this line here, where this line is straight. It, it looks kind of like this is bowed outwards. Um, it comes down, there's a bit of a curve, and then it straightens out down here. It looks as though the distance between this straight line and the rectangle is smaller down here and larger up here. But that's not the case. Watch what happens when I bring the straight line close. It overlaps exactly. What you're seeing is an optical illusion. This is called a herring illusion. And it's, it's the effect of having all of these, these radial lines coming up uh, on the, the vertical. It makes it look as though this line is bent or curved. So this is an interesting dial that has a straight line that looks curved, and it has a curved line that looks straight. So that's, that's our the fifth design. Um, now notice what we have here is really two six-month dials. We have this dial for six months, and then we have this dial for six months. Suppose we, we, we separate them, bring them together, we see the declination lines here from equinox in three months to the winter solstice and then back three months to the equinox. And here, equinox in three months to the summer solstice and back three months. Now the layout of these declination lines is the same for this dial as for this dial. So these lines, the declination lines, are all placed exactly the same way. We can overlay them. We can put one on top of the other. So now these lines, instead of representing six months, give us all 12 months. We have equinox to summer solstice to equinox to winter solstice and back to equinox. And this would be a dial that works, a lot of lines in it, but the hour lines now be, are bent. You see the two o'clock hour line, for example, is here. You use the red portion during the spring and summer and use the blue portion during the fall and winter. And the same happens during the gap. Red portion here and then blue portion uh, for the uh, fall and winter. That's the sixth. I have one more design to show you. I want to go back a bit because if we're concerned about the shadow being long enough uh, to reach, we it might make sense to consider the gnomon height. So so let's do that. We can for every point in the lattice here, we can do a calculation that will tell us the height we need for the gnomon at that date and that time to make sure that the shadow at least reaches to that point. So this will tell us what that height is for each date and time. Now, it's easy to show that for any given date, so for any given one of these lines, a gnomon height that casts a shadow from here to the one o'clock point if, if the gnomon is, if the shadow is long enough at one o'clock, it will also be long enough throughout the rest of the day. So whether we're dealing with the winter solstice or the summer solstice, we need to make sure that the, the gnomon is long enough so that its shadow at one o'clock hits the point for the day. But what one day, gives us a gnomon height that will work 
that will work for uh, sorry about that my wife's jeweler um what one day gives us a gnomon that works for for the entire time well that again depends upon the value we choose for k if k is greater than the uh, tangent of the latitude divided by the cosine of 15 degrees we need to pick the height for the winter solstice a height that works on the winter solstice at one o'clock will work for the entire time if however k is less than the tangent of the latitude divided by cosine of 15 degrees, we need to pick the height that will work for the summer solstice. So that's interesting. If, it's, if your height is greater than this, you want the winter solstice point. If it's less than this, you want the height here. Let's suppose that we just consider the case when k equals tangent of the latitude over cosine of, of uh, 15. When you do that, this is the formula for the height of your gnomon. Here is the actual gnomon length in that case. For this configuration, for this value, it, uh, it says P, this should say K. Um, I had originally labeled this uh, variable as constant as uh, P, but I, I thought you didn't want to be listening to an old man talking to you about P all afternoon. So I decided to change it to K, uh, forgot that one. So for this configuration, the gnomon length depends only on the latitude uh, we choose. In the gap, and only in the gap, we'll use the end point of the shadow to read the time. The rest of the time, of course, we need to know what the date is. But in the gap, we just look at the end point of the shadow so those lines are simple mnemonic hour lines. They're perfectly straight. You have no need to know the date. And for these, not only is the shadow always long enough for the lattices, but from 11 o'clock to one o'clock, it's short enough to stay in the gap. So I, I call this a, a Goldilocks gnomon. It's, it's long enough for the lattices, short enough for the gap. And if we had any other value for K, it would require a longer gnomon to suffice uh, at all times. If we had, if we increased K, we'd need a longer gnomon on the winter solstice. And if we decreased K, we'd need a longer gnomon on the summer solstice. So this value for K gives the minimum length. It's not too short, not too long. It's just right. And with that, I'll say thank you for your attention. If you'd like to get a copy of this uh, slide presentation, you can send, send me a note at uh, this email, read the article in the next compendium coming up. And Helmut Sonderegger's free program, Sauna, has just come out with version seven, which you can download here and you'll be able to draw one of these dials for your own latitude. And I'll turn things back to Frank. Right, thank you very much, Fred. I think you can hear me now. And uh, well, there are one or two questions in. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to cope with these. Um, Are we hearing Frank? I'm not no, hearing. We, he seems to have dropped off, Fred. So can you see the questions and, and pick some? Um, yes. Let's see. Uh, can you explain uh, again how the gnomon looks? Uh, is it upright? Yes, it is. Um, it's, it's basically just a stick. 
uh, the thinner, the better. Um, is it basically by shortening? I'm not sure what, what he meant by that. Um, Richard Thiessen, why didn't you use a positive K value right from the start? Um, minus 0 0.8749 is my favorite number of all time. Um, but I didn't know, I, if, if you use a, a positive, um, what you get is the winter solstice lines are on the outside and they tend to be very long. So to keep the, the design looking uh, nice uh, and it fitting on a screen, I use the negative because the, the summer solstice lines, when, it's, when you have a negative K, it's not as, uh, uh, as bad. You'll find that's true on virtually any of the azimuthal dials. The, the first two I showed with the concentric uh, circles, the difference was whether you had you know, summer way out or winter way out, and that gave you uh, differing values for the, uh, the lines. Uh, could you make the gap larger, say between 10 and two? So you wouldn't need to know the date uh, for more time, if you see what I mean. Uh, yes, I could do that. In fact, I could, I could do away with, uh, I could make the, the gap for the entire day, but then what you get is a standard horizontal Mnemonic sundial. It's it's uh, uh, you wouldn't have to know the date at all, but you have uh, a sundial the likes of which have been known for over two thousand years. Um, well, I think it's starting to be time to wind up. Uh, Bill Weisick has uh, posted a feedback survey. We are really very interested to know how you thought about this. Uh, event. Uh, we haven't done this before. And as you can see, it's a little bit wrinkly at the edges, but um, I've greatly enjoyed all three of these talks. And I'm especially grateful to our North American friends for coming along. Uh, the feedback survey is on our website. Uh, you'll see a note about it on the chat page. And we would like you to fill this in. My own view is that I just like your three form comments. Say what it is you like, say what it is you don't like, say what it is that you would actually like to have, which we haven't laid on. Uh, is this something which we could do perhaps once a quarter uh, or you take your own time period? Uh, should it last just a, an hour? Uh, up to you. Any, any comments would be welcome and we'll, we will um, digest them. So thank you very much for everybody for taking part. Um, any of the speakers want to make some final comments? Um, there, there was a question there about uh, the Pocellier linkage. Uh, oh, is yes. it related to this dial? Uh, it's it's not related to the dial, but it is the same Pocellier, same, same person. I'll, I'll just mention uh, one, one person asked whether there's a webcam um, still operating at the University of Washington on a large wall sundial there, but that was uh, uh, seven years ago now. It operated for two years. It was just too much trouble to um, maintain it and I couldn't find the right students. <laughs> In other words, I didn't want to do it myself. I had a great guy for a couple of years uh, so unfortunately, it does not uh, operate anymore. But there is one in, in Austria. I'm forgetting the guy's name. Um, but uh, it is operating. Oh, there he is, Kurt Neal. Uh, we've never met. And now I, now I see what you look like anyway. Um, and uh, I'm hoping to visit your dial someday. But uh, that, that is still operating, is it not? Great. Yeah, it looks like a beautiful design, too. Roger, you got any final comments? Yes, I quoted my email address earlier uh, for anybody who might want to get in touch with me. 
Let me quote it again. It's very simple. RT Bailey 101 at gmail.com. If you send that to chat, they can read it or paste it. Okay. I will do that. I think Woody got most comments. So there are an awful lot of people out there who would clearly like to have a reflection that sundial effort of their own. Uh, my own view is this is a lot of hard work. <laughs> I, well, I start off start off simple. Yes, um, that's the way things are. Yes, just just I, a I, noon mark or a five p.m. mark if that if that works better for your schedule or schedule, and um, you know, and, and then you can elaborate more depending on how how gung ho you are. Well, a lot of people saying lots of nice things about all these talks. So um, I think I'll conclude. Let's let's do a wrap up. Thank you, everybody, for um, coming to us. Uh, delighted to see you. Uh, join the North American Sundial Society or the British Sundial Society if you're not a member already. We would love to see you more in the flesh sometime. And um, so thank you and goodbye from all of us. So.